And uh, not only will I uh, sort of outline some of those challenges, but I'll, I would like to also share the sort of conceptual apparatus that one can use to grasp not only the sorts of challenges that I'm uh, going to mention in my talk, but also other challenges that may arise that uh, I don't have any conception of as of now. <clears throat> so essentially, uh, teaching a man to fish rather than giving him the fishes is what I also expect to do. Um, so let me start by saying that um, most of this talk is going to come out of my book, which has just come out. Um, there are two parts of that book. Firstly is that, uh, as Francesca very kindly mentioned, uh, I'm the only person to have conducted field work within the Indian Foreign Ministry. And as far as I'm aware, apart from uh, Ivan Neumann of here, uh, there really isn't anyone else who's done that sort of thing. Of course, what sets me apart from Ivor is that I wasn't an employee of the Foreign Ministry when I was doing my field work. Um, so there's that uh, unique data set. Uh, and secondly, I, the, the data set led me to theorize Indian diplomacy in a way which has not been conceived. Um, and, and it's quite, uh, I find it quite odd that it hasn't been thought of in, in such terms. And the terms uh, to introduce it are essentially in the terms of the relationship between the two most significant people in the Indian nation state's history. And that is, of course, Jawaharlal Nehru and his mentor, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, so but what I would rather begin with is a schema, as I said, for understanding the, the challenges India poses. I'll then move to charting the, the types of challenges India poses and the manners in which they will appear and what this means for Europe and the global West at large. And finally, I will try and overcome uh, something that Henry Kissinger and uh, other uh, uh, diplomats who have engaged India have written about. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what Henry Kissinger, Kissinger wrote. Uh, India is a democracy, by far the best functioning and genuine free system of any of the nations achieving independence following the Second World War. Its ruling group speaks excellent English. The Indian civil service, though extremely bureaucratic and influenced by theories imbibed at the London School of Economics, is one of the most effective in the developing world. Almost all of its leaders have studied in Western universities. Yet Americans have great difficulty in coming to grips with the, in, with the way Indian leaders approach foreign policy. So I'll try and deal with this conundrum by outlining a, a theory of how you, one can understand Indian diplomacy. And I think you will find that it is quite different from the way in which diplomacy has been conceptualized, or international relations in general has been conceptualized in the Western world. So to the first part, conceptualizing the Indian challenge. Um, I'll talk about three, three aspects of this. The first is net security. I'll explain in a moment what that means. The second is presentism. And interlinked, but I think distinct at the same time, is the question of nationalism. So net security, by, what do I mean by net security? Net security is not the internet security, but net as in total security. Um, Net security ought to be understood in two ways. One is external security, so the challenges that India faces at its borders, so you know, territorial integrity, for instance, the, the long-running conflict with China. Uh, that's one aspect of net security. Uh, but there is a much broader and uh, uh, rather different part of net security, and that is the internal security of the Indian people. And this I think is far more significant than, for instance, the border issue with China or other externalities, um, external threats. Uh, what do I mean by the internal component of net security? Well, it's, 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 it's quite simple, really. It's, um, it's as simple as providing toilets for Indians or building houses for an increasingly urbanizing population. Uh, this is not the time or the place to, to list all the the violence that Indians suffer on an everyday basis just by living in India, by not enjoying the facilities that are available in any developed nation. I mean, that, that's probably all apparent to you um, already. But essentially, this part of security is what I think occupies Indian diplomacy uh, to the largest extent. 
India will, of course, challenge any country that tries to oppose its uh, realization of net security. But in actuality, I do not think that there is any state or any uh, political organization that wants to challenge India or wants to stop or prevent India in any way from realizing uh, the internal aspect of, of net security. But as I said, it will, of course, challenge if, if the need occurs. Um, the second point that I mentioned is presentism. Now, the manner in which net security is understood is firmly based on current conditions. And it arises from the here and now, the actual lived lives of Indian citizens. If you listen to the speeches that in top Indian diplomats give, uh, they say that the, the impulse of Indian foreign policy uh, perhaps could be explained in terms of Western theories, realism and all that sort of thing. But actually, what it is is all about really just improving the everyday lives of everyday Indian citizens. And that's, of course, because the present is dark. Uh, as, uh, and and as, I, as I've just said, um, I mean, I, I talked about the sort of things that Indian diplomacy wants to provide, and that I was just talking about the urban population. I mean, the rural population is at a at a far more inferior position as compared to the urban population. So it is the present. It is what is the situation right now. Interconnected with this is the role of nationalism. Now, Indian diplomacy, I argue, is geared to the situation now. And this will generate, perhaps, challenges to the West. The challenge will manifest itself in two ways. Firstly, as I said, if there is a conflict with a Western nation to India achieving net security, However, as I also said, I don't see this as a likely problem, apart from climate change-related issues, and I'll, and I'll touch upon that as we, as we move on. But even here on climate change, the emphasis on the here and now rather than historical uh, responsibility. What is far more significant a risk uh, to Europe and to India as well, I would argue, is the risk of Europe withdrawing from South Asia. Both of these points that I've just mentioned are interlinked by a uniquely Indian relationship with the past, which can rapidly undermine Europe's position in India and Asia, and that is nationalism, but not perhaps for the reasons that you think. The reason that I mention nationalism in connection with Europe is, however, as I said, for an unexpected reason. Nationalism is, of course, widely accepted as the most common dynamo driving foreign policy no matter if one talks of Greece or of Thailand. Nationalism is generally a high policy concern, not least amongst Europeans, given the role that the phenomena of, of nationalism has played in your histories. Germany is, of course, a historic example, and perhaps opposition to the European Union is a current example. But in the Indian setting, nationalism has taken on recently um, an, a new sort of urgency, and that's, of course, with the election of the Bharatiya Janata Party. So there are scholars and analysts, I suppose, all around the world that are, are very keenly interested in what, uh, what face Indian nationalism from an overtly nationalistic party will be. Yet I would argue that nationalism has no role in Indian foreign policy. In other words, what I am saying is that it would be a grave error to even contemplate for a moment that India will act in terms of widely understood historical ideas. And by widely understood historical ideas, I'm talking about things like colonialism, neocolonialism, and insults uh, that uh, people say India has suffered on the international stage, or widespread discrimination. Let me explain. So let's unpack the term nationalism. Nationalism comes in two variants. The first is organic, which arises from a mythical past of either greatness or humiliation. You know, India was this, and so it should be so again. Perhaps this is said of, uh, said of Chinese politicians. Um, and the second is, of course, elites manipulating the masses for fake, to put it very simply, uh, nationalistic purposes. Neither of these are true for Indian diplomacy. After all, just look at the history of Indian diplomacy. India's greatest foreign policy uh, emphasis, India's greatest foreign policy efforts until very recently have been to engage the very countries that were involved in colonialism, neocolonialism, 
and all the rest that goes with it. If you think most recently about the Indo-US uh, one, two, three nuclear agreement, what was that about? That was India responding to what it called a nuclear apartheid and racism. But the whole point of Indian diplomacy was to overcome it, to engage the very perpetrators of, from Indian eyes of that apartheid. So essentially, the geographical zones that are most heavily impl implicated in colonialism, neocolonialism, and discrimination against India are the ones that India has historically dealt with the most. Um, and that just does not include, that, that, that does not stop with Western Europe and the United States. Russia, too, is, is uh, viewed in such terms by India. And the most recent example of this is the negotiations for India to buy its aircraft carrier from the Russians. And, there, and if, you, if one was to speak to Indian Ministry of Defense officials and foreign, foreign ministry officials, you would get a palpable sense of the fact that the Indians felt that they were cheated by the Russians. And they were cheated essentially because the Russians stated that here we have this product, it's in this condition, and we'll sell it to you for X. Uh, whereas what then happened was the product was nowhere near what the Russians claimed it was, uh, the condition in which it was, and the price uh, more than doubled. So despite this history, uh, certainly perceived in, in, in India of, uh, of, of, of a negative history, a negative relationship with the European world and perhaps the United States, um, and in direct contrast with the case of China and what most scholars argue for India, I will again repeat here and now that India's complicated history of being dominated by Europe has absolutely no role to play in its foreign policy. And the reason for that is going back to the earlier concept that I outlined, which was the presentism of Indian foreign policy. Indian foreign policy is resolutely committed to improving the present state of India. The past plays no role in dealing with the present state of, the Indi of Indian society. <clears throat> now, what I'm saying about at the level, at the broad level of the Indian state is also matched, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, by Indian diplomats. So during my over a year that I spent embedded within the Indian Foreign Ministry, um, what Indian diplomats said about their everyday lives and about their rationales for joining the Indian Foreign Ministry quite closely matches what I've just outlined about the Indian state. So Indian diplomats were not joining the Indian Foreign Ministry for either because they were in awe of great leaders or trying to reclaim some past glory. They were quite simply joining the Indian Foreign Service and the bureaucracy in general to improve their present condition. Why did they choose to join the foreign ministry or the bureaucracy? Well, actually, largely, most of them don't want to join the foreign ministry. It's a, a default option. Um, it's because they have seen the lives of Indian civil servants. And they see how that is much better than their own current life, and so here they see a channel for them to improve their present situation, and so they work on it. So there is no, as I was saying, no nationalism or sense of awe or any, some, any greater idea that is motivating Indian diplomats apart from the fact that they want to improve their current situation. And that is, of course, also what I say is the state for New Delhi's foreign policy. So the similarity between the way Indian diplomats act and the Indian state acts is obvious and should be unsurprising. Both Indian diplomats and the state act to secure their net security, understood in very simple everyday terms. And this is a reflection of the current state of, uh, of, of um, well, disrepair, shall we say, of the Indian economy and the state. Yet oddly enough, Indian diplomacy continues to be understood in the terms of power politics. That is, as if India seeks to progress linearly from zero to one, that India is seeking to achieve a certain set of goals, and that these goals will be achieved in a duplicitous manner. Now, what do I exp let me try and put these three concepts that I've outlined in terms of, in terms of actual practice. So net security in practice uh, demonstrably shows that there is no uh, linearity to Indian diplomacy, and instead it is highly contextual. Secondly, there is no, and the very fact that there is no linearity to, in, to Indian diplomacy is why I was saying that events from a long time ago do not color 
Indian actions today. <clears throat> so take the 123 nuclear agreement with the United States, uh, for example. What that treaty demonstrated was the confluence of the external dimension of net security and the internal dimension of net security. The reason for my saying that the 123 agreement marked a convergence of the internal and inter external aspects of net security is because the treaty provided both energy security for internal development and challenged China by showing China that India had um, a big guy on its side. But this was very different from the American purpose of engaging India for the 123 agreement. Uh, during my field work, it, my field was, was during when the 123 agreement was being negotiated. Um, I remember talking to the then uh, foreign minister, who's now the president, Pranab Mukherjee, and uh, he was practically foaming at the mouth at the fact that the Chinese kept, uh, sorry, the Condoleezza Rice kept on telling him that she would make India into a great power. And she would make India into a great power if India was to bandwagon with the United States against China. And he said, he, he said that he just could not get it across to her that India had no interest in being a great power. India wanted the nuclear deal desperately, no doubt about it, but the purpose and the reasons for India wanting it were very different from how the Americans understood it. The reasons why India wanted it was firstly to get uh, to go move beyond a regime of apartheid, as India called it, so to correct uh, discrimination, which existed then and there. And secondly, India wanted it because it was going to guarantee energy security, or at least go some way towards guaranteeing energy security and allow India to improve its net security, the internal dimension of net security. Thirdly, the, there, was a, there was another benefit to the, to the 123 agreement, which is not really much talked about. Another great reason why India wanted that agreement excuse me, was because India had been placed on United States entity list. What that essentially means is that a whole range of technologies that the United States has developed were not available to India. During my fieldwork, one day when I was chatting with the former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, he said essentially why this was so significant. And Manmohan Singh was, of course, the architect of the 123 agreement. He said that we cannot, as in India, cannot be like China. India cannot become a manufacturing base for the world. And secondly, the whole way in which manufacturing is conducted has entirely changed. There is a high degree of automation now, which didn't exist when China was modernizing itself. But what Manmohan Singh wanted was to get India off the entity list and build on in India's services sector. Essentially what he wanted was India to move beyond providing the sort of back office services that India provides currently when you, for instance, book an airplane ticket or get your taxes done. So a lot of these back office processes are now conducted from India. Manmohan Singh wanted to move this to a higher level of back office services. So he wanted Indian, Indian scientists to start doing the very run-of-the-mill sort of research and experimentation that uh, leading companies in, say, California uh, wanted done, but at a fraction of the cost. But of course, leading Calif companies in California could not send a lot of their work to India because India was on the entity list, and therefore it would be breaking US law to send these uh, technologies and, and techniques to India. As it happens now, India is off that list, and that was one of the great aims of the 123 agreement. The point, of course, being that it was to improve the net security, as in the internal dimension of net security. There was an uh, unexpected advantage to this, which, uh, which was an improvement to the external security environment of India. But that was not what primarily motivated diplomatic thinking when India engaged, this, uh, engaged the United States to get this agreement. The unexpected benefit to the 123 agreement on the external side was that the Chinese began to realize that India perhaps had a strong ally, a strong partner. Um, and from what Indian diplomats keep on telling me, the Chinese are still convinced that the 123 agreement with India has a secret clause, where since the United States gave so much to India, as in you know, the, the United States allowed India to be exceptional, an exceptional member of the nuclear suppliers group. Um, the Indians must have given up something substantial to the Chinese. 
uh, in very practical terms, the, 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 the closing of India and, and China was manifested itself in 2005. In a joint statement uh, between India and China at the time, uh, when Manmohan Singh was uh, meeting the Chinese Premier, his foreign secretary uh, said that the, the Chinese had made certain demands of India and India had agreed. India wanted in return that China recognize that the, the settled populations on the border of India and China would not be affected by any border agreement. And the Chinese apparently agreed to this right at the last moment because they, were, they, they realized that the Americans were moving closer towards India. So it was, India was able to get that only because it had America on, on side. As it happens, within uh, months of that uh, joint statement, the Chinese began backpedaling on that idea. OK, so if those are the grand ideas behind that one can use to conceptualize Indian foreign policy, uh, let me now move to charting the systemic challenges that India poses. So I've now talked about the 1-2-3 agreement. And the big question probably on your minds is that will there be any such big ticket challenge to the global order posed by India? And the answer, quite frankly, is probably no. Uh, but this is not because India does not want such change. Let's take greenhouse emissions, for example. On greenhouse emissions, India would certainly like the establishment of a, of a, of a global uh, fund, which not only provides the monies to build uh, non-polluting energy sources in the third world, but also transfers technology. And India would certainly like this fund to be populated by the historic polluters uh, that exist today. But however, greenhouse, but, but that's not going to happen. I mean, India wants this, India, but India is not going to be able to get this because of the fact that India does not have an ally like the United States anymore. But greenhouse emissions also provide a window to the tactics of the, of, of the Indian challenge. At a tactical level, India will continue to not agree on any principle on greenhouse emissions. Like, for instance, they're supposed to be talking about uh, putting forward a cap on greenhouse emissions within the next few weeks. But I doubt that that's going to emerge. Instead, what India will do is politely ignore the issue and sweep it under the carpet. So at a, ta at a tactical level, they will just not engage the West on this matter. What is far more significant, of course, is what I alluded to, which is the notion that India lacks a partner. The 123 agreement was brought about because India had a partner in the form of the United States. India lacks such a partner now. New Delhi is obviously incapable of delivering systemic change on its own. In short, the fact is that the kind of systemic change that India would like is impossible for New Del Delhi to deliver without partnering with someone. This incapacity is significant because it raises the question of what will be the role of Europe and the United States in the partnerships that India seeks to forge. In other words, how will India manage, to glo manage the globe to realize its net security? And how will the developed world respond to India's management? The way one can chart this is by first perhaps looking at the decline of the United States and, and the sort of fear that is spread throughout the United States and to an extent in, within the European Union. The first pertinent point is that since 2008, the only Western country capable of assisting India to embark upon transform transformational change uh, has been largely incapacitated. That country is, of course, the United States. And in the eyes of India's top diplomats, there is not now much that the United States can do to aid and assist India. If this realization has happened in New Delhi, there has been a similar realization in both Washington and perhaps various other capitals in Europe. And that is that India essentially can't be bought out. So if India realizes that the US is not ideally placed to assist it anymore, there is a growing realization in Washington. And this is that India cannot be manipulated. After all, despite Washington transforming the international nuclear architecture to suit India, New Delhi did not provide what the United States wanted, 
essentially New Delhi did not bandwagon with the United States uh, to, uh, to contain China. Allied to this is um, a related point which, which somewhat contradicts what I've actually just said, which is that despite India not having the partnerships to bring about transformational change of the, of the type of the one, two, three agreement, this does not mean that there will not be systemic change and that it is not on the cards. Only that the agents that appear best poised to deliver it are unfortunately not Europe and not the United States anymore. And this, I would argue, is an error that Europe is making. And that error is essentially Europe and the United States retreat. There are, of course, two sides to this coin. And the retreat, essentially what I'm talking about, is um, the investment climate. The, Euro the European Union and the United States is not investing at the same, in the same ways as it used to, or as I would argue, it ought to, and as India certainly would like it to. Uh, there are two sides to this coin, of course. Undoubtedly, uh, as, as uh, every uh, global survey shows, uh, Western CEOs complain about uh, how difficult it is to do business in India. Uh, so undoubtedly for India to realize the internal dimension of net security, it will of course have to embark on some transformational change within the borders of India and make some hard de decisions about how, about how investment is rooted into India. Um, an example of this is uh, Norway, for example. So Norway in 2013 made some investments in India and uh, then uh, those didn't do terribly well. So since then, Norway has been shying away. Norway's funds have been shying away from India. This needs to change. Of course, as I said, one side of it is that India has to do more to, uh, to uh, convince uh, Western Europe and the United States that India is a reasonable and safe place to do business in. And that requires building, uh, embarking upon confidence building measures. But there is a threat to Europe acting in this manner in Europe retreating from South Asia. Because what there exists now, which didn't before, are replacements. And there are several replacements waiting in the wings to replace what Europe ought to be doing in India, but isn't. And the problem of, one of the bigger problems that arises from this is that Europe's historic ties with India, positive or negative, uh, and various conceptual matches for example, we talk about democracy, uh, could be essentially wasted because Indians will act to, to improve their current situation now and not think in terms of supposed commonalities. All that Indian diplomacy is really interested in is in terms of the internal aspect of net security is how to improve the situation now. So it is not only important that Norway and others thinks very carefully about how they make investments in India, but of the perils of withdrawing from India. This is because, as I said, there are willing nation states that will replace Norway and the United States. And the result of this can only be the formation of new communities of nations founded not, well, not, not on democracy, perhaps, on very different ideas. So if Europe wants to maintain uh, those commonalities, those ideas that it values, then I suggest that they think much more deeply about how to continue engaging India rather than retreating from India. In short, European reticence will corrode its historic ties with India because in New Delhi will not wait for Western investments to realize its net security aims. And the vacuum that is being formed by with Europe's withdrawal is going to be filled by Asian nations. It is at this juncture where what I call reckless courage, the reckless courage of Indian diplomacy comes in. And I use that term because uh, Mahatma Gandhi used it uh, when Hitler sent an SS colonel to meet him and talk to him and find out about what made him tick. And instead of the SS colonel actually asking Mahatma Gandhi about what made him tick, Mahatma Gandhi was essentially interested in the reckless courage of Germans who were so willing to sacrifice their lives in, in, uh, to, to uh, well, supposedly improve the, the condition of the human race. Uh, so a large part of this conversation that Mahatma Gandhi had was 
about this reckless courage, and he wanted to learn this reckless courage from this uh, Nazi colonel. But then, at, towards the end of the conversation, Gandhi made the point that you are so recklessly courageous, but for such an illogical reason. And the illog illogicality of it was, of course, that the Germans died to save the human race by also killing large parts of the human race. But it is that reckless courage that I think still permeates Indian diplomacy. And it, can be become, it becomes obvious um, by the drawing in of Asian investment. It also, again, demonstrates the presentism, that is, the lack of any historical or nationalistic guide to what Indian diplomacy is all about today. In short, India is not trapped by the past, but seeks to remake the present on its terms. And this becomes apparent if you look at the burgeoning relationship with China. The current, an Indian ambassador a few years ago, and I think 2007 or 8, uh, to Peking, was the first person to organize a huge conference of Indian business people in China. And the purpose of this conference was essentially to get Chinese people, to in, Chinese companies and banks, to invest their huge surpluses in India. That person has now become India's top diplomat. He's called S. Jai Shankar. Now, S. Jai Shankar was the first Indian bureaucrat to do this publicly. And of course, he is opposed by several elements within the Indian bureaucracy, most notably the security branches. But the very fact that he has been elevated to Foreign Secretary, I think, shows which way the tide is turning. Um, what this also signals is that India is quite willing to replace Western organizations and make China the, the instrument of realizing the internal component of its net, net security. And the reason why I say that this is recklessly courageous and not contained or a product of history or nationalism is because um, India, as you all know, fought a border war with China and continues to face off the People's Liberation Army every so often who make incursions, the Indians claim, into Indian territory. But at the same time, India is quite willing to set aside these issues and look to China to invest and to realize its net security aims. So the very same country that cha challenges India's external security is to be the source of India's ex internal security. To perhaps put it in Europe, European terms, it is like asking you, it's like Ukraine asking Moscow for development aid. So the ways and means of this, this engagement is that one instrument of Chinese investment, which is currently being crafted, and that is the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank. The sort of change that this institution will bring about is not through a big bang change like the 123 agreement, but it will bring it about incrementally. However, the cumulative effects of, the, of such a change, I think, could potentially far outweigh what the 123 agreement did. One area on a very practical level that is sure to be transformed, and one of the reasons why India was looking uh, for something like the Asian Infrastructure Bank, is because India essentially was not getting the sort of loans that it wanted for the sort of development projects that it wanted to conduct. So the, the usual organizations, the Asian Development Bank, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, are very, very chary of, excuse me, of lending money to India for projects such as coal power plants. The Asian Development, uh, sorry, the, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, uh, from what Indians believe, from what Indian bureau bureaucrats believe, will, will not be so chary about giving the sort of funds that India wants to build such, such plants. What this also signifies, so this is at a very practical level, the sort of change that will take place. But what it signifies at a broader level is if Europe talks about ideas, common ideas and common frameworks for reference, such as democracy, et cetera, these are going to be very rapidly replaced by the ground reality. And that is the ground reality of increasing interaction between India and China. And what this means for the way in which the two countries approach each other and the rest of the world is yet to be seen. It is not just large nations that have a role in the transformation of India and in the partnerships that India is seeking to forge. 
So if India and China are on the cusp of forming a new community, this does not mean that there is no room for other such communities. There is also a definitive role for small nations, too, in becoming part of the change that India seeks to foster. So Singapore is a case in point. A few days before I came to Norway, I was uh, talking with the Singaporean ambassador to New Delhi, and they are pushing India, Singapore is pushing India, to forge a strategic alliance with Singapore. Now, this strategic alliance will build on several unique facets to India's relationship with any country. So one thing that India does only with Singapore is, for example, rent out military bases. India only rents out military bases to Singapore. The Singaporeans want to help develop the, and broaden this engagement at the military level. At the same time, Singapore, the, Singapore claims that its foreign policy concerns match India in the South China Sea and closer towards China's maritime borders. So what one, see, what one is seeing over here is that India is both engaging China as an investor and forming a strategic alliance or on the cusp of forming a strategic alliance that will once again challenge China uh, on, the, on, on its maritime borders. So this, I would say, is another example of, the reckless, of reckless courage. For while forging, as I said, the infrastructure bank, where China will be primus inter pares, undoubtedly, New Delhi will also continue to cha challenge China not only on the Indian land border, but also mar in maritime terms. I'll finish this section on, uh, on, what, uh, on, on the challenges that, that India poses by, by focusing on Europe. The challenge for Europe I think is clear and obvious. India is neither tied down by history nor by nationalism. Rather, New Delhi's aims arise from its present state, and this is to realize the internal aspect of net security. To do so, new alliances are already being forged, not officially, but they are, of course, being forged unofficially. I mean, what else can the Asian uh, Infrastructure Bank be called? And they are often forged because the West and its institutions will not do what New Delhi expects it to do, and in the requisite manner. Clearly, then, Europe has two options, to continue to be a bystander or further withdraw from South Asia, or redefine the terms of its engagement and its own parameters for action and engage New Delhi. The rationale, and now I'll come to the final part of my talk, the rationale that I've been outlining is, as I said, something that is unencumbered by the past, resolutely focused on the present, and not linear. By not linear, there's one aspect is, of course, it's not, you know, Indian foreign policy today is not determined by uh, perceived rights or wrongs from the past, but not linear is also at a very practical level. So if you look at the Indo-US 1-2-3 agreement, India did not seek to move from its present exclusionary position to joining the world community. It wasn't a zero-sum game. What India actually did was change the international community to suit itself. And the way in which India did that was by, being the, by making itself an exceptional member of the nuclear suppliers group. And the way in which India is exceptional is that India is the only country that is allowed to maintain some of its nuclear reactors beyond the IAEA's inspectorate. So every other member country is op has to open all of its reactors to the IAEA. India does not. So that's, that's what I'm talking about, transforming the world, bringing the world to India rather than India moving to the world. This is quite different from the way in which, for example, Norway and other European investors have reacted to India. Uh, the reason why these, these investment vehicles have withdrawn from India is because they invested the investments did not do as well as they expected it to, and so then they retreated. India has no sovereign wealth fund, but if you look at India's uh, equivalent actions on the world stage, it, with China in particular, India is both engaging China and engaged in a holding pattern with China uh, by forming strategic alliances and, well, and the other thing that India is doing is, of course, strengthening its, its borders. So essentially what there is is, there, it, it is the way in which Indian diplomacy views itself and the rationale for action for Indian diplomacy is not to move from here to there, but to do it in a very different way. There is both, at the, at the one hand, there is engagement, 
and at the other hand, there is uh, a holding pattern or even uh, advancement. The way in which this can be conceptualized, I think, requires, uh, requires a, a very different set of tools, a different toolkit. Traditionally, European diplomacy has, of course, been understood as uh, the starting point being anarchy, and you bring order to anarchy. Uh, so it's a linear, linear line. So there's anarchy at one end, and there is a, well, something uh, akin to utopia at the other end, and diplomacy is supposed to take you there. Indian diplomacy is, however, not linear in that sense. The, I think a better way of in which one can conceptualize Indian diplomacy, and this is the toolkit which I think will be useful uh, for people to think about what India's actions may be in the future uh, in fields that I haven't mentioned, is to think of Indian diplomacy in, con in, in contextual terms. So Indian diplomats, when they judge why they joined the Indian foreign ministry, or New Delhi when it makes its foreign policy towards Beijing or Washington, does not think about historic events or the past. It thinks about the current context. What is in the current situation that affects policy making? And it is based on this contextualism of an, that, that policy making is made. What this contextualism then illustrates is a completely different way in which Indians apprehend and think about the world. And that completely different way is what I would call a cosmological sense. Because the only way in which one can think logically in contextual terms is if you think of uh, the world of interrelated actors. So there are contexts, and various contexts throw up different requirements, and one acts in those contexts. These ideas um, are, not, uh, are, are ideas that I picked up during my fieldwork. And these ideas are reproduced by the Indian bureaucracy. The way in which this, this, these ideas are reproduced by the Indian bureaucracy can be best illustrated by an example. And I think I'll close with that example. During the Indo-US uh, negotiations, there was a senior diplomat in India who objected to India's growing closeness to the United States. Um, he, things came to a head, things came to a boil when the United States said to India, uh, right, so now we are giving you all of this. You must show that you will support us internationally. And the way in which you can show that you will support us internationally is by voting against Iran at the United Nations. Now, India had never done this before. India's prime minister was quite happy to vote against Iran at the United Nations. This diplomat, his name was Rajiv Sikri, he wrote a note objecting to India's uh, shift on, uh, on, on Iran, and essentially argued that um, if you do this, you're sacrificing a stable relationship for the pipe dream of, uh, of an Indo-US nuclear agreement. So much rather you stay with what you have than gamble everything on something that may or may not come to pass. The person who was, that, that advice was not listened to as it happens. Manmohan Singh did vote against, uh, India did vote against Iran. But as it happens right now, today, India has excellent relations both with Tehran and with uh, Israel. Uh, and relations, the relationship with the United States uh, continues as it was. The reason why India was able to do that is because diplomacy is not seen as a zero-sum game. What I've just told you was a small battle within the Indian bureaucracy between someone who did think in terms of a zero-sum gain of, and of linear progress. But he was stamped down. He did not, his view did not win. As it happens, he was in the running for the top job of the Indian foreign ministry, and he didn't get that job. Uh, the person who was promoted to that job firmly believed in the idea that India can both have its cake and eat it. But the point, of course, was that in that eating and having the cake, uh, India can't do it if the rest of the world, if the, if, it, what, if the countries that have been traditionally regarded as traditional allies of India for ideological or whatever other reasons seek to withdraw from India. And that is the danger that Europe runs by withdrawing from South Asia. So I think I'll stop over there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think we can open up for questions. <coughs> and I think if you're OK with it, we can open for both questions on your talk and on 
more broadly sure, sure. Indian diplomacy and foreign policy, since we have probably one of the people who know the most about this around. So anyone who wants to start, Paul? Um, yeah. I work here at the Institute. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you would care to comment. Uh, you emphasized quite a bit on India's priority for domestic development, but India has also been involved as a development actor in Afghanistan. Is that Does that signify a new chapter or maybe a sub-chapter in Indian foreign diplomacy? The short answer to your question is yes. And what is really interesting about this, well, uh, about 10 years ago, the top Indian diplomat was questioned by parliament on this. And he was essentially upbraided by India's parliament for apparently not doing enough to, uh, to uh, build friends and influence people in Africa. And so he was given this question. And in response, what he did was rattle off a list of, uh, of African leaders and parliamentarians who had been educated in India on foreign ministry scholarships. So he was saying, how can you say that we are not trying to influence people and, and all, of that, all that sort of thing in Africa when, when this is the situation? But yes, that has been upgraded a notch. The reason why it has been upgraded a notch was not because that the will was never there, but, now, but the funds were not. If you look at India's tax collection, that has gone up substantially in the last 10 years. And a large part of these, of, uh, well, I mean, I mean, a tiny fraction, of course, but the, the amount that is being set aside for development has been increased. The second part of this is what is most likely to be carved out with the Asian Infrastructure Bank are zones of influence. Where will China invest and where will India invest uh, using the Asia Infrastructure Bank? That, but that, that is something that is yet to be worked out. Great, thank you. And I forgot to say, do please introduce yourself um, when you ask a question, as, as Paul just did. Um, next, I have Björnes. Hi, um, Björnes Svarotegisson, also from the Institute. Um, thank you so much for an interesting speak. Um, speech, that is. Uh, again, uh, your speech being so interesting and the area itself being so interesting, it's sort of hard to pick exactly which question to ask because there, there is just so much uh, salient matter in there. But but to go, um, so I think I might open just with two questions from two rather different uh, areas pertaining to this topic. Firstly, uh, I'm curious to hear from your background also as an historian. Um, I find comparison with China fascinating in that for China, history really plays such an extensive part in how you conceptualize and formulate foreign policy, whereas uh, you have claimed that for India that is really not the case at all. Of course, the things that both India and China has in common is that they are perhaps the two civilizations with the most deeply rooted um, historical traditions. Uh, and you know one of the longest uh, historiographical records. So, how come the conceptualization of history turned out to be so different in those two great civilization states? Um, and the second one, uh, which goes a bit more into the geopolitical field, uh, is that I would also be interested to hear your view on um, India's Western. Um, border, where China is currently involved in this very um, highly publicized development project together with Pakistan, uh, um, uh, economic development zone, and uh, the infrastructure development there, and how you think that will shape both China-India relations and the wider geopolitical outlook of the area. Thank you. Okay, so to answer your first question, uh, why is history thought of differently? Now, there are two broad ways in which academics have approached this. One is uh, going back ages from to a, uh, to a, a Middle Eastern scholar who came to India long before you know India was India, uh, and he said Indians don't write history. Um, just as Indians, you will see that there are no Indian maps. Uh, the maps that are made of the place are all by outsiders. Uh, 
nowadays, the brother of the India's top diplomat, uh, Jai Shankar, is a man called Sanjay Subramaniam, who's a scholar at, uh, I think, UCLA uh, or Berkeley. And he argues that Indians actually did write history, but they wrote it in a way uh, that um, people today don't recognize. So there was always historical writing in India, but it wasn't un 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 it's not understood as such uh, today. But the more common uh, perception is that, in, in that Indians don't have a history. Um, and this, the, the evidence for this, or they don't think about history in the same way. Now, the evidence for this is uh, quite manifold. So going back even to uh, Indians living under Mughal rule, uh, the Mughal rule was only possible because Indians were, were complicit. I mean, you know, it wasn't with the British that that happened. But in Indians, uh, you'll, you'll find records left behind by these Indians. They've completely Persianized themselves. Um, and they, they say, and, and they, they talk about the pain that they feel when they encounter a temple which has been raised to build a mosque. Um, but they, then they say, oh, well, um, let's move on. That, that's something that, that, that can be managed. So essentially, even going back 300 years, what people, what these records show was that the people were managing historical pain by completely negating it now. I'll give you an example of how this is done even today by, uh, by Indian diplomats. So in the Indian Foreign Ministry, we have, uh, India has positive discrimination. So if you come from a lower caste or from an economically underprivileged background, you get preferential treatment in the civil service exams. I had a friend who, when I asked him his name, wouldn't tell me his name, uh, his surname, that is. Later on, as we became much closer friends, he told me that he had dropped his surname because that gave away his caste. So, but the way in which he got into the foreign ministry was by utilizing his caste, because he could have, of course, appeared as a normal candidate and just taken the exam and be treated, treated like everyone else. So here he was, at the same time, using his caste to get entry, and at the same time, negating that element of his identity uh, by dropping his last name. And that is what I say, I mean, the parallels with India's dealing with China. And on the one hand, India is engaging China with the Asian Infrastructure Bank, and the other still moving to contain China now in the South Seas, the uh, South China Seas. On the Western border, what has been done for the last, uh, since Manmohan Singh became Prime Minister, and that policy is being con continued by the current Prime Minister, is essentially something very similar to what Nehru did with the forward policy, excepting Nehru did it in a very ham-handed manner, in a not, not a very uh, well thought out way. What Manmohan Singh began to do was to not only open old bases along that border, but also build new bases. So right now, uh, India has recently bought this uh, military transport aircraft called the C-17, uh, I think, or it's Globemaster, it's called the Globemaster. And the Americans said that it can't be used in the sort of altitudes that, uh, that you know, exist on the, on the western border. But the Indians have managed to modify those aircraft and are able to land them over there. So not only are, is India building uh, infrastructure as well, so matching China's infrastructure projects, but don't, of course, expect India to be able to uh, operate at the same level of China. Um, Manmohan Singh himself said, uh, China is about 40 years ahead of India, and that is in terms of capacities. So India is trying to do what it can uh, in its own way. The broader idea towards the Indochina border crisis or issue is essentially India is not interested in solving the problem. India is not interested in solving the problem because Indian diplomats believe that the Chinese are very much like Europeans or Americans. They only respond to power. And India is, of course, overall, vis-a-vis -vis China, in a much weaker position. So essentially, all they want to do is maintain the current situation until India is in a position powerful enough to actually bring about a settlement with China on the border. We had a question here from the gentleman in blue.
Right, thanks. Um, Osbjorn Lerbrek is my name. Um, I recently retired um, after having been uh, in the Norwegian Foreign Service for, for quite a while. Um, I was wondering if you could touch upon some dimensions um, that you didn't explicitly mention. Um, now, I was a little bit surprised about the historical, the sort of the lack of history uh, notion. Um, not from the examples you mentioned, but what about relationships to neighboring countries? Uh, not history necessarily for hundreds of years, but at least history for uh, 50, 60, 70 years. I mean, is it possible to understand today's relationship between India and Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, or India and Nepal, without looking at the historical context? So maybe uh, the history element, at least um, medium-term history, rather than a long historical record, plays um, a larger um, uh, notionally amount of focus for Indian diplomacy, at least when it comes to the neighboring countries. Second question, um, the look east argument that um, Asian investments will um, take the role that uh, investments from um, uh, Europe and North America has had in the past. Um, and But you mentioned only one aspect, which was not economic, uh, the strategic engagement with Singapore. Um, what about the prospects in economic terms? Wouldn't the Asian investors um, partly face some of the same bureaucratic hurdles as Western investors? Um, and partly, wouldn't the, the issue be that quite a few of the countries that India would say we're looking at, um, we look east. Are those countries not also looking east? In other words, not west to, towards India, but east from Thailand, Malaysia, to or northeast to um, Japan and, and South Korea. Um, and the it would be interesting if you could explicitly also address um, India's relationship with Japan, uh, because it seems to have some both um, geostrategic um, dimensions and economic interest. And finally, why do you think the um, lending policies of the uh, new Asian Investment uh, Bank will be so different from the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank that they will push and make it possible for India to get loans for coal-fired power plants? Okay, well, you've given me a lot to uh, think about. Those are very pertinent questions. On the notion of the lack of history with neighboring countries, one of my chapters begins with a quote from the f a former top Indian diplomat. That they're called foreign secretaries in India, a woman called Nirupama Rao. And uh, I think uh, she said something like, there is a need to deal with history in a more productive manner. <clears throat> and she was talking about Pakistan. So it is very similar to what the gentleman asked me when 300 years ago uh, a, a native of India saw a temple raised. He felt a bit of pain, but he decided to negate it. Essentially, what Nirupama Rao was also arguing for was the same. Now, the reason why Nirupama Rao was saying things like this was because India was trying to get a, 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 a trade treaty with Pakistan with you know most favored nation status and all that sort of thing. The problem was that Pakistan was completely unwilling to set, to, to set aside the Kashmir issue from trade matters. So this is why Nirupama Rao said Pakistan was trapped by its past and unable to get over the, the history, the very recent history uh, with India. But India was trying to do so. If you look at uh, the foreign, foreign ministry's official pronouncements on this, it's basically quiet resignation and not being able to overcome this. Um, India's trying to change this, so Bangladesh is a recent example. But, what, but th this, this treaty that has been signed with Bangladesh now on the border could have been signed some time ago. It was just that an Indian politician stood in the way of that uh, coming about. On Look East, um, 
Lukis began with, uh, I mean, if I understand you correctly, your, your issue, the, your questions are first, Asian investors should also face the same sort of hurdles that Western investors do. Um, Asian countries are not actually looking west, but they're looking east to Japan and perhaps the United States. And thirdly, uh, and, and in particular, what is the role of Japan? And thirdly, why will the Asian development infrastructure banks policies be different? I, the the uh, uh, Look East policy began with Narasimha Rao. It was realized, the first actual realization of that policy, what it, the first deliverable, was a treaty with Singapore called CECA, C-E-C-A. Uh, the re my, uh, as it happens purely by chance, my father wrote a book called Looking East to Look West, Lee Kuan Yew's Mission India, um, which was based on lots of conversations with Lee Kuan Yew about um, Indo-Singapore relations. Uh, he also asked Manmohan Singh about why Manmohan Singh negotiated this treaty with uh, the Singaporeans. And remember, at the time, it was kept really under the cover. The me Indian media really didn't talk about it at all. Um, Manmohan Singh didn't want to talk to my father about this, but he did set up a meeting with, his, with the lead negotiator of Sika. The lead negotiator of Sika was a man called BVR Subramaniam. What BVR Subramaniam said was that the thing that, Sing that Singapore was granted by India was something called pre-establishment, which meant that the moment a Singaporean firm and an Indian firm signed on the dotted line, they would be treated as equals under Indian law. So until then, no other foreign company, even if it was engaged in a business relationship with India, was treated uh, uh, the same as an Indian company under Indian law. And he said that this pre-establishment gave a certain degree of security, which is why uh, you know, Singapore today is the largest channel for foreign direct investment into India. What Subramaniam then went on to say was that India signed it with Singapore, because in Singapore has the same sort of agreement with Japan and the United States and the European Union, or European countries. So Manmohan Singh was not able, couldn't push for such an agreement with, let's, I mean, to put it crudely, with a white country. So he was able to, but he was able to sort of push it through with an Asian country and a very small, insignificant Asian country. But of course, it was, it was almost a force multiplier, because then Indian companies could deal with the United States under the same treaty terms, which they couldn't before because India and the United States don't have that sort of relationship. And American companies, vice versa, could also deal with India uh, at the same, in the same way. So my point of telling you this is that India actually wants to engage them because they are looking west, not necessarily because they are looking east, or at least that's how it began. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, looking east rather than looking west. But this relationship has now matured and has changed. So India is now regarded as useful in its own right and as a useful investment situation. I don't know about the broader reasons for the sort of hurdles that Asian businessmen would face in India, but I do know this. At a policy level, Singaporean investments are not frowned upon in India. At a policy level, India uh, has only signed treaties to release out uh, military bases and uh, testing ranges and all that sort of very sensitive thing, at least by Indian standards, uh, to Singapore for a very simple reason, which was articulated to me by a, a, a Singaporean diplomat called Tommy Koh. And he said, uh, we essentially uh, don't pressurize you. The United States, from what I, Tommy Koh was saying, that the United States, from what I gather, is always asking you for something in return. We are just middlemen. We are happy to make money by just investing in India. That is the ultimate aim. There is no other geopolitical aim that Singapore wants out of India. But of course, that is, I think, also beginning to change. That is why India and Singapore are now discussing a strategic partnership. On Japan, uh, Japan has um, an interesting place in the Indian psyche. So. The former prime minister and the current prime minister as well uh, see Japan as a great social model for India because they see Japanese people as being both Asian and Westernized at the same time. Uh, so in that social sense, Japan is a great model for India. At the same time, of course, Japan is looking to India for support in dealing with China. 
and the way in which Japan, I mean, that's, that's one part of it. And Japan is, in, a, in some ways, trying to replicate what they did in Thailand. So you develop India as a huge export market for Japanese manufacturing. And this was to certain, this has been to certain degrees been realized by various trade treaties between J Japan and India on the import of um, motor vehicle cars and, and um, you know, scooter and, and motorcycle car, uh, uh, engines. Um, but the great bulk of Japanese investment has not come through as yet. Uh, so what is often paraded uh, or bandied about is that India is building with Japan's, you know, huge, a huge industrial corridor between Bombay and Delhi, and then from Delhi to Calcutta. But this really hasn't materialized. Or, I mean, there is, of course, some things that are happening, but it hasn't happened at the rate at which one would have expected. Uh, and the reason for that is because, essentially, what the Japanese want is a semi-fixed currency swap in, uh, agreement, so that they have some idea about how you know, they, the, their currency will be valued against the Indian rupee. Uh, and that hasn't yet been worked out. Now, that this. Working out this sort of thing is uh, what I was talking about when I said that, of course, India has to build confidence uh, with the rest of the world to show the rest of the world that it is interested in, 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 in investment. Uh, the very fact that India has not been able to work out this is, of course, a negative for the Japanese. And these are the sort of hard decisions that Indian leaders must make. Great. I think we have a question at the back. Uh, hello, my name is Priyanka Chakravarti. I'm from uh, the University of Oslo. Um, uh, you talk about how uh, Indian foreign policy is uh, basically driven by India's internal development needs. I was just wondering why uh, is that not more explicitly elaborated in the dominant narrative or in the discourse of various uh, Indian leaders or even for that matter by the media? For instance, the technology uh, clause that you mentioned about the one, two, three deal is something that which we mm. didn't come to know through the media. Mm. And secondly, you mentioned that the Indian foreign policy is not determined by nationalism, and that is the reason we engage uh, with erstwhile colonial powers. But um, it could also be uh, the Indian desire to be able to negotiate with them at an equal at an equal level. And that could be a form of nationalism. And uh, one example of that could be India's refusal to accept aid on uh, several occasions. Great. Th those are two very good questions. So on the first point of why isn't this articulated, the answer is twofold. Firstly, uh, pretty much I would say every analyst of Indian foreign policy uh, has been trained in American international relations. So they're thinking of what India does in a very different language altogether. Uh, which, and, and, that, and essentially what I would say is that they cannot articulate what Indian diplomats and diplomacy is doing. That's the first point. So the very way in which international relations scholars of India think and write about things is in an American way, which is very different uh, to, to what India does. So I'll give you an example. Sumit Ganguly, for example, in one of his books, says India and Pakistan are at, 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 the, at a very minimum different from how they understand foreign policy uh, and their rationality for foreign policy is completely different. But then he says realism explains it all. So I mean, this is completely illogical. But this is how Indian foreign policy is analyzed. Your second point, um, I'll, just before coming over here, I had breakfast with the foreign secretary. And I asked him the same question. And he said about the current prime minister that the current prime minister's opinion of Indian debate is very low. And uh, he also thinks that the debate at the, the level of the people who debate matters in India is also very low. So the first is that the media conducts it at a very low level. And he doesn't think that Indian people are really terribly interested in discussing these matters. So Jay Shankar said, 140 character tweet is, is enough for him to communicate with the people at the level at which the people want. The rest of it can be done by him, uh, really by him, uh, with the, the technical inputs from his uh, bureaucracy. We had, a, we had a question here in front. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Lars Martin Fosse. I have three questions for you. Um, 
First of all, we just talk about India's net security. You mention internal security as uh, part of this. And I wonder if you could be a little bit more concrete uh, concerning the problems that face internal security. In, in what sense is this tied up with foreign policies? Does it have to do with economic investment? Does it have to do with foreign powers uh, fomenting trouble inside India to put pressure on Indian uh, the Indian government? What exactly are you thinking about? Then the second question has to do with your uh, talk about uh, non-linearity in Indian diplomacy, that it's sort of uh, not tied in with uh, India's history. Uh, I have two questions in connection with that. Uh, uh, first of all, I would wonder if uh, or how uh, the relationship between um, India and uh, those countries that were heavily influenced by Indian culture in the Middle Ages uh, functions. Is there still a reflex of this function? It goes all the way to Indonesia. And the, the, the third point here is that uh, although you don't have a um, uh, history writing in the Middle Ages and before that, which uh, is recognized as, a, as history writing by European or Western scholars. Uh, we recognize the Raja Tarangini as the, uh, the first real history written by a Hindu. Uh, but before that, you had a very advanced and sophisticated uh, theory of political practice, which is um, uh, which we found in, in the Arta Shastra and uh, in the sections on the statecraft in the Mahabharata. And uh, when you talk about these seeming illo illogical actions of uh, of the um, the uh, foreign policy that. Uh, that India uh, conducts. It made me think a bit about uh, these old uh, writings about politics. There's a sort of, uh, there may not be an historical continuity in the, in the way you talk about, but there is a spiritual or intellectual continuity in the way politics are thought about. Do you have any comments to that? Yes, no, I'm, I'm very glad you asked that question. Uh, I'll begin with your last question first, if I may. Uh, one of the reasons why I argue that uh, Indian diplomacy is quite different from European diplomacy is because one day the top Indian diplomat came to lecture two batches of, his, of new entrants into the foreign ministry. And he, you know, being an experienced man, 30 odd years in the foreign ministry, uh, already knew something that I had come to realize, which is that most new entrants into the Indian foreign ministry have no idea about what they're expected to do. So he began by saying to them, how, do you, how many of you have any idea of what your job as a diplomat is? And they all nodded their heads as in, in no. And he said, do you remember what Krishna was doing before the Great War? And they immediately knew what he was talking about. So the way in which he made sense of their profession to them was not by reference to any European canonical text or otherwise. <clears throat> the way in which he made, made the, their job sensible to them was by referring to something which every Indian pretty much knows because they've heard it on their mother's lap. And the reason why every, and, and in this sense, the Mahabharat is especially important because the Mahabharat was designed for every Indian to be known. For example, when the Mahabharata was actually written down as a text uh, several, what, couple of thousand years ago, it was written in the script of the low caste. It was written by Brahmins, but it was written in the script of the low caste. Because, of course, it was a, you, you know, to use a slightly loaded word, an act of propaganda. It was to put forward a certain ideology. Um, and yes, so in that sense, I think the way in which the Mahabharata deals with uh, with the world and explains the world, uh, it, is really a uh, it is really a text of ideas, of philosophy. And it was, of course, also written in contrast to other philosophies, most particularly Buddhism. Uh, those ideas have held root. Uh, 
So that is why I think it is quite possible for Indians to quite easily affirm one part of their identity in one context and in another context completely uh, negate it. So in that sense, yes, those, those ideas certainly continue. The Artha Shastra, I do not think, is part of the, the makeup of the Indian, intellect, uh, Indian mind, quite simply because it was actually lost. And it was only discovered in, I think, 1909. And then you know, it, it, it's talked a great deal uh, about, but it's not really part of the living life of, of Indian people. Um, your first question on net security, I, uh, from what, when I met Jai Shankar, I asked him pretty much the same sort of question, and he essentially said that it is all about investment. It is all about trying to improve India's, the daily lives of everyday Indians. Um, th and that in itself is the greatest challenge that he faces. The challenge that he faces, as I said, that there are two parts of this. One is that Europe cannot just withdraw because one investment goes bad. But the second part, of course, is that Europe has to, uh, in, India has to reassure Europe. So when the SICA was, was negotiated, after it had been negotiated, various Indian politicians wanted changes to the negative list, the, you know, the items that could be traded and all that sort of thing. So, and Jai Shankar was at the time ambassador and in Singapore, and he was really quite annoyed by these demands that were being made. So th this requires a great deal of management uh, and is an end to itself. And um, your second question on non-linearity and what about India's cultural influence uh, in Southeast a in the rest of the world, it uh, reminds me of something that Paul Wolfowitz said when he landed in Indonesia. He said, I see India everywhere, but I find it nowhere. Um, <clears throat> and that is very much the case. Um, you see, of course, remnants of India's civilization and what India is called Suvarna Bhumi uh, in Southeast Asia, but it wasn't followed up. It wasn't followed up for two reasons. One is that Indians historically never colonized Southeast Asia. They only set up trading posts, and those have faded. Of course, uh, certain elements of Indian culture remain, but I don't think any of this really has much to do with Indian foreign policy making today. But it makes a nice gloss, a nice story to, to package things with. Great. Thank you so much. We're running out of time, so I think we'll, we'll end it there. Um, I hope you will join me in giving a big hand to Deep. This has been great, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Um, you should definitely feel free to mingle and talk, and we can offer you a coffee and things. But I think we should do it outside the room, because I understand there's another event taking place here in three minutes. Um, and if you're interested in uh, the book that's on display, we'll also move it to outside the room. Thank you very much for coming again.